Alrighty, if you would, open up your Bibles with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, as we continue our series through this wonderful gospel that God has sovereignly ordained and brought out John Mark to write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at verse 2, we're going to read all the way down to verse 8, and then I'll pray and ask that God would bless preaching of his word. So Mark chapter 1, verse 2, it reads, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism for the forgiveness, excuse me, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with a camel's hair. And wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, now, as your word goes forth, bless it, O oh God. Bless your truth. Enable me to be accurate, to be zealous, to be passionate, and Lord, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for the hearers, for those who know you, to be grown in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be more like him, and to be encouraged as we commence a new week today. And for those who are lost, Father, I pray that they would be saved this very day as your word is preached, that they would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, may you be glorified in us and in your word and in the preaching of the gospel of grace and in all things as you work all things for your glory, Lord. May you be glorified and may the Lord Jesus be glorified and may the Holy Spirit, the, the triune God, be glorified, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. The title of this is The Ministry of John the Baptist. When we consider how we ought to conduct ourselves as believers, who may we look to in the Scriptures? Who may we look to in the Bible? Well, we can look to different characters. We can look to the Old Testament to Moses, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, in the New Testament as well, Peter, Paul. It's, those are characters for us to look at all throughout both Testaments. And one of them being, of course, is John the Baptist. But how are we to act in, our, in relation to the Lord Jesus? How are we to be in our disposition toward Him? And how are we to preach the Gospel? How are we to deal with unbelievers? And how are we to reference the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe that looking at the life of, of John the Baptist shows us those things. Through his preaching, we see how he preaches the gospel. How he preaches the good news of the coming of the Savior. I believe we see how to deal with unbelievers. That he dealt with them in such a manner that exposed their sinful hearts to the need of salvation that they so desperately had. And I think by looking at him, especially in relation to how he honored Christ, we see a perfect example on how we are to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. But in reference to John, who was this man? This elusive character. What did he do? How did he preach? What did he preach? What did he say? And what did he think of Christ? 
We're going to see those questions answered here today as we look at this text of Scripture. But before we look at the passage itself, we want to always, always, when we look at Scripture, consider the context of the passage we are considering and looking at and studying. In chapter 1, specifically, we see the, a brief look, a brief treatment of John the Baptist's ministry, and then later on in the next few verses, we see the beginning of Jesus' ministry, beginning with his baptism, and then how he goes and preaches in Galilee, preaches that people ought to repent and believe the gospel, and then later on we see how he does uh, cast out a demon, and then he goes and heals many people, and then by the end of the chapter we see that he deals with a cleansing of a leper. And specifically, uh, in, the, in this chapter, this section, right before it, right before verse 2, we find verse 1, the beginning of the chapter, which would be the title and the opening of Mark's Gospel. And the last sermon that, we, we, that I preached out of that text was the Gospel of the Son of God. And we considered various passages throughout the book of Mark relating to the good news. Because that's what Mark announces his gospel is going to be about. That's why in verse 1 he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's the good news. And then as we just saw, he moves into first telling us, giving us some background to Jesus and to his ministry. Because really Jesus' ministry came and built upon a foundation that was already laid. And that was John the Baptist. Jesus came dealing with people who had already dealt with and saw John the Baptist. And so it's important we understand who he was, what he said, how he dealt with unbelievers, and what he said about Christ specifically. That's, that's ultimately the culmination of John's ministry, was a, a big pointer to Christ. And so let's look at the text. In verses 2 through 3, we're going to see the prophecy, the prophecy that's spoken of here. Verse 2, what does it say? It says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of my crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now this, this quotation is actually a, a mixing of two different quotations. From the Old Testament. It's not just one verse or a couple of verses from one passage. It's actually taken from two separate authors in the Old Testament. One of those quotations, which is the beginning, where it says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, that's taken out of Malachi, out of the book of Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 1. It says in Malachi, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, and against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So the reason I read that, that context of that verse is I want us to understand what is God saying there in Malachi? Because if, if, if Mark here is quoting to us and quoting to the, the reader of this, the, the original recipients of this gospel, they would have gone back to Malachi and read what was the context of what Malachi was saying. And here, and here it written through the prophet, or said through the prophet, is the coming of Jesus, it's the coming of the Lord, and God talks about how He's going to restore His people, and how they're going to be pleasing in His sight. 
It talks about that in verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. So he uses, Mark uses a messianic passage, a messianic <laughs> prophecy. At the beginning there in verse 2. And then the second part of the quotation, the second part which says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. That's taken out of Isaiah 40. You don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 40, verse 3, listen to what it says. It says, a voice is calling. Clear the way of the, for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth a desert, or excuse me, in the desert, a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. So again, even here in Isaiah 40, it's a messianic prophecy. The glory of Yahweh is going to be revealed. Who is he? What was he referencing? It's the coming of Mashiach. It's the coming of Messiah. That is what Isaiah was writing about, just as Malachi. But not just Jesus, but John. John is the one who is going to be the messenger who comes before the Lord. John is going to be the one who is the voice in the wilderness. Saying, make ready the way of the Lord. In fact, you know what's interesting is all four Gospels quote Isaiah 40, verse 3. In relation to John, Matthew 3, 1 through 3 says, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Luke chapter 3, same thing. It says, And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John as well, in agreement to Matthew, in agreement with Matthew and Luke, writes in John 1.23. It says, and this is speaking of, uh, this is John the Baptist speaking, it says, he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So John the Baptist burst on the scene and he grabs hold of this prophecy and he says, I'm the one who's fulfilling this and I'm coming as a forerunner. I'm coming as someone who is, who is in, in, in front of Christ to proclaim his coming. Oftentimes the New Testament quotes the Old Testament to build on the foundation that's already been laid, to show the basis for the truth of the gospel. In fact, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament roughly over 850 times. That's astounding. So it's only uh, it's only common, it's only something that, that John the Baptist would rightly do, that he would burst on the scene and grab hold of this prophecy and say, I have fulfilled this. He was a messenger before the Lord. The John MacArthur Study Bible, I love to consult the John MacArthur Study Bible when I'm, when I'm preparing my sermons. And this is what it said on this verse, verse 2. It says, In ancient times, the king's envoys would travel ahead of him, making sure the roads were safe and fit for him to travel. So this is, a, this is not only a, a, a historical background in terms of the Old Testament, but there's a cultural understanding here of what John the Baptist is coming. He's claiming to be an envoy for the king. He, he is someone who is clearing the way. In, in their days, that's what uh, the kings would do. They'd send people ahead of them to be sure that the, the path was safe and straight, free from robbers and other, other things that might come upon them. 
as they traveled. In fact, uh, we even do this in America on a smaller scale. President Trump or uh, a previous president were to go somewhere down the street, they would, send, they would lock down the city, they'd send cars ahead and cars behind, and they'd have secret service everywhere and military personnel to be sure and safe to clear the way for the man who's in authority over us and ruling over us. And so, John the Baptist comes as an envoy for the King of Glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a, he's a chosen messenger. In fact, uh, Jesus said in Luke 7, 27, He said this about John the Baptist. He said, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus adds, adds to what was already written here in Mark, in Mark 1, in Luke. He says, yeah, John has fulfilled this. He's the messenger who has come before me. What was his message? What was John's message? Acts chapter 19, verse 4. It says this, Paul said, now this is Paul preaching and teaching, and he references John the Baptist. Listen to what he says about John's ministry. He says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. The gospel according to John the Baptist is the same gospel today. It's the same good news. Christ saves from sin. And so uh, John the Baptist is, is telling people to what? To believe the one who is coming after him. And, and one of the things that he's also doing is he's, he's conducting this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. We'll talk about that a little later on. In fact, uh, the Greek word here that is used for messenger in verse 2 is an interesting word. It's angelos, which is actually the word for angel. It's translated a messenger, an envoy, one who is sent, an angel. In fact, it's translated angel 179 times in the New Testament. And so it's used of, of John here. It's a high, this is a high calling for John the Baptist. Very high calling. Specifically, though, what is, do we have any more data? We may ask ourselves, do we have any more data in the New Testament concerning what else John was preaching about? Well, we do. If you flip with me to Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew 3, 7. This is a, this is a, a portion of Scripture where we, we see given to us more information about what John was preaching about. Verse 7. It says, but when he, that would be John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, now I want you to listen to John's preaching. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up Children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. That does not sound anything like preaching today, or what is sometimes called preaching. Do you see any resemblance between this and what is called preaching today, especially even in an evangelical church? We're in a Southern Baptist church. We don't see preaching like this. I mean, listen to the first thing he says. These people, these Sadducees and these Pharisees are coming for baptism. Something that is in some ways positive. It would seem like, from John's perspective, that would be a good thing, right? 
First thing he says, you brood of vipers. That was a, that's an insult. He's insulting them. But now without due cause, he was just calling them out for what they were. See, true preaching gets to the heart. True preaching just addresses the heart issue and doesn't, doesn't mess around with, with other things and try and sugarcoat the truth. It lets the truth go forth like a sharp sword so that it cuts the heart in half. And that's why John preached that way. And notice he Notice of some of the things he talks about. He talks about bearing fruit and keeping with repentance. Verse 10, he talks about how the axe, that would be, uh, that is symbolic of God's wrath, is coming. And he says, it's already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And again, as I've addressed before, look at where we find ourselves today in modern evangelical Christianity. People, everyone seems like, especially here in Lawrence, is converted, right? Everybody's a Christian. No, they're not. Most of them are liars and they're self-deceived. And they're deluded, thinking themselves to be converted, but they're not. How do we know we're converted? How do we know we're saved? How do we know that the profession of faith we have in Christ is legitimate? Do we bear good fruit? If not, what does John say? A tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And we know what fire he's talking about. Verse 12 says the same exact thing. He says, he's speaking of Christ, his winnowing fork, and that would be this big metal tool, and it's very sharp, very, very sharp. And the, 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 the farmers would use it, they would, they would swing it, and they would get all of their, uh, that's how they harvested their wheat. They would chop the wheat, they'd grab it, and they would put it in bushels, and then they would put it in their, their barn. Or their storehouse. And that's what it says. It says his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff. And then it's a fire. What was chaff? It's a leftover. It's not the, not, the, not the fruit. Not the crop. Not the actual beneficial part. Burn up the chaff. And then quenchable fire. In other words, what John's saying is. People who just say they follow Christ, but they really don't follow Christ, they're going to be burned up. But the unquenchable fire of God's wrath. Also, another aspect of John's ministry was loneliness. He's a lonely man. He's just a lonely, lonely man. He lived out in the desert, in the wilderness. And later we're going to see he ate locusts and wild honey. Disgusting. It sounds nasty to the Westerner. And even to some Easterners. He's a lonely man. And that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's one of the attributes of someone who's called to preach. Someone whom God has raised up to preach. They're going to have a lonely life. They're going to live a lonely life. It's not an easy thing to be a preacher. It's not an easy thing to be called by God into ministry. Because it, it, it by default carries with it loneliness. Loneliness. I can vouch for this out of experience. And I can tell you even for friends of mine who are in ministry, they can vouch for it out of experience. But God so has in His wisdom ordered it to be that way so that we fall upon Him because He's all we have. In our weakness, we flee to Him for grace. And His grace sustains us. So even in John's life, as he's lonely and he's out here in this wilderness, I mean, you can imagine, he would have, he's a human being, he'd experience the emotions we experience. He would have experienced loneliness. And yet he relied upon the sovereign God of mercy. Also, I want us to consider this, the significance of John the Baptist's ministry. How significant was John's ministry? Very, very significant. In fact, uh, we know that really he was the end of the Old Testament prophets. He was the last one. He was the culmination. It all came to a head with John. I don't have time, but if I did, I would actually take us through Luke chapter 1, which describes how um, his father Zechariah and his mother Elizabeth uh, experienced, uh, or specifically Zechariah, how the angel appeared to him while he was in the temple. 
told him about his son being born, how he actually wasn't able to speak until after John was born, and the whole story of how that happened, which is really amazing. We just don't have time to do that this morning. But in Luke 7, in Luke 7, verse 24, listen to what Jesus said about John, John's ministry. It says in verse 24, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. This is Jesus speaking about John. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? That would be equivalent to Jesus, like if he said it here in America, he did. It's like, he'd be saying, an oak tree being blown in the breeze? What did you see in verse 25? But what did you notice go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and no one, and, excuse me, and one who is more than a prophet. Whoa. Prophet. The office of a prophet, especially in the Old Testament, was a very high office. Very, very high. In fact, we know out of, a, out of the Old Testament record that a prophet even had the right to rebuke the king of Israel. A king. Which would be the highest position in Israel. We see it when uh, after David sinned with Bathsheba. Who came and rebuked David? Nathan, the prophet. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 27. This is the one about whom it is written. We just read this a minute ago. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. But listen to verse 28. I say to you, among these, excuse me, those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow. It was significant. John was a, John was a rare jewel. Not just a prophet, but the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus even goes further and says, No one born of women is better than John, greater than him. The MacArthur Study Bible agrees with me because it said this on verse 4 John was the culmination of Old Testament history and prophecy. In fact, uh, it's not only recorded in Luke that Jesus said this, but also in Matthew. Matthew 11, 11, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now I want us to see the second part of this text, going back to Mark 1. We saw verses 2 and 3, the, the, the prophecy. Here's the fulfillment in verses 4 through 8. And specifically in verses 4 through 6, we see John's actions. John's actions, what he did. Verse 4, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. Specifically in verse 4, we find something important, and that is the significance of preaching. The significance of not just John's preaching, I'm not speaking just of him, but preaching in general. It's, it's God's chosen means to bring His word into this world. One of the references is Acts 2, where Peter preaches to the great crowds of Pentecost. What happened? 3,000 people were converted on that day. Or if we go to the book of Matthew, what do we find in Matthew? Matthew uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7. We find the, the, um, Jesus' sermon on the mount. Jesus' greatest sermon he ever preached. Preaching is God's chosen means to bring His Word into this world. That's why in this church I've spoken on this before, is the significance of the Word in our worship. Our, our, the worship that we join together every Sunday to have, it is centered around the preaching of the Word of God. Because that's the chosen means. And 
And even in church history, God has used it. God has used this means to bring great revival. As I referenced earlier, George Whitfield preached to thousands of people each time he could preach. And it was in the fields. It wasn't in churches. It was in the fields. In the highways and the byways. And God used that as an ordained means to bring many to salvation. However, that never negates the preaching of the word specifically in the church. In fact, it establishes it. Because whether the word is preached outside the walls or inside the walls, it's the word preached. And it's powerful. Very, very powerful. Also, it says there in verse 4, it says he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What does that mean? Or for the remission of sins. Your translation might put it that way. What does that mean? Well, actually, it's very simple what it means. People were coming and repenting and they were receiving forgiveness of sin on account of Him who was coming. It was all pointing to Jesus and His coming, finished work. Acts 13, 24, Paul said this of John. He said, John had proclaimed before His coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Specifically, this was directed toward the Israelites. This is preparing the covenant people of God to see their Savior. It was preparing people's hearts, turning them away from their wickedness. God said in Leviticus 20, verse 40, He said, If they confess, He's speaking to the Israelites, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they have committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humble, so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. And I will remember also my covenant with Isaac. Psalm 32, 5. The psalmist says, I, I have acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So he's preparing the people. Repent. Confess your sin before God. So that you'll be forgiven and saved. Also, um, he, he uses the term here, all the country of Judea. Does that actually mean, there, there in verse 6, does that actually mean everyone? No, this is hyperbole. This is just, just an exaggeration. He's embellishing it. But he's wanting to stress the importance of it. It, it was something that everyone was to do. And this is, this is true even now, today, in the New Covenant. Everyone is to repent and believe the gospel. No one is exempt from this. No one is exempt from needing saving grace. And therefore, all must come to Christ. It says that they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And even the Jordan River, even where this took place, had significance. The Jordan River was a very significant spot. It was a place where it would mark the boundary of Israel. To the west was Israel. To the east was not Israel. To the other lands. But we actually know from the Old Testament record that a couple of the tribes actually dwelt on the east side of the Jordan. But specifically, when we think of the Jordan, we really need to go back to Probably the most important event that happened at the Jordan River. And that was Joshua leading the Israelites into the Promised Land. It was a boundary, it was a marker, and when they crossed it, when they crossed the Jordan, they were there. If you remember, God told Moses he could not go into the Promised Land because of his sin. But Joshua could. He led the Israelites into the Promised Land. And interestingly enough, what was Joshua's name in Hebrew? Yeshua. What's Jesus' name in Hebrew? Yeshua. And Jesus and Joshua are the same name. In fact, if we were to translate Jesus' name out of Hebrew to English, it would be Joshua. And what does that mean? It means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. Interesting. Joshua was a, was a type of Jesus. 
He was a type of need who was to come. He was a foreshadowing of the Savior. Because what does Jesus do? He leads us into the promised land of eternal salvation. I could go more to that. That'd be a whole sermon there. Because that's, that's incredible. He was, a, he was a type of him who was to come. Verse 6, it says, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt, belt around his waist. Why did he do this? Why on earth? Well, I think for one of the, one of the things that, that it seems to be from Scripture that he did this, maybe it was for multiple reasons. Maybe one to show us he was set apart. Set apart from others. But I think specifically to show us he was in the spirit of Elijah. Because we know that Elijah came and did this very thing. In 2 Kings 1.8 we know from that text that, that that's how Elijah dressed. He was dressing like Elijah. See, we also know from the Old Testament, God promised before Christ came, before Christ came to the earth, Elijah was going to come. And the Israelites, even to this day, because they obviously don't acknowledge Christ for the most part, the Jews do not acknowledge the Savior, they still think Elijah's going to come back. Elijah's going to come. That he is going to come, and, and before the coming of Messiah, he's going to appear and preach. But listen to what Jesus said about this in Mark 9, later on in verse 11. It says, they asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Obviously before Christ. Verse 12, And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And yet how is it written that the Son of, excuse me, of the Son of Man, that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished just as it was written of them. Elijah has come. Who's he talking about? He's talking about, um, he's talking about John the Baptist. It's not that Elijah himself has come, not the actual person, but someone in the spirit of Elijah. <coughs> really, he was the most significant. In terms of before John, Elijah was the most significant Old Testament prophet because he did so many miracles. We're all familiar with what happened on Mount Carmel. We're all familiar with a lot of stories about, uh, throughout Elijah's ministry. Because it was so significant. And here John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah. Even wearing the clothes that Elijah was wearing. Matthew 11, Jesus says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's pretty interesting. So if we have Jewish friends or family and they challenge us, they say, hey, Elijah didn't come before Christ came, before the supposed Messiah. We say, yes, he did. A man in the spirit of Elijah came and prepared the hearts for the coming of Messiah. Also, in terms of, as it says in verse 6, that he ate locusts and wild honey. Even that speaks to his humility. He was a simple man. And he ate some of the most lowly things. Leviticus, was, in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 11, verse 22, it actually is one of the places where God says the Israelites could eat this kind of food. It says, These of them you may eat, the locusts in its kinds, and the devastating locusts in its kinds, and the cricket in its kinds, and the grasshopper in its kinds. So it was one of the animals God did allow the Israelites to eat. And interestingly enough, uh, I was researching about locusts, and they have more protein. They're, they're pro more protein dense than beef. That's some strong protein. It sounds like Bear grills would do something like that. It's high in protein. But even wild honey was also filled with nutrients. Filled with nutrients. So he could have survived all this. He, scientifically, he could have survived this way. Would it have been comfortably? That's, that's debatable. I certainly don't think I would have been very comfortable. But it showed his life of separation. It spoke to the fact he was humble. And it spoke to the fact he just out there alone with God. In his ministry. 
Lastly, as we bring this to a close in these last two verses, verses 7 and 8, we see the preaching of John the Baptist. As from Mark's perspective, even though it's very short, it's very concise and very truthful and very potent. Verse 7, it says, And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Christ is the mighty one of Israel. He is the mighty one of Israel. Uh, the Greek word that is used here for mighty, when he says, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, is ishuros, ishuros, which means strong, mighty, powerful. It's actually derived from another Greek word that, 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 that is used for mighty, that's used for strength and power. And this had a lot of Old, Old Testament significance, what John was saying here. And the Jewish people would, under, would have understood what he was saying. In the Jewish mind, when he, when he said, one who is mightier than I, he's referencing the mighty one of Israel. Isaiah 124 says, therefore the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, ah, oh, I have, or excuse me, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. Genesis 29, uh, 49 verse 24, Jacob said of Joseph, he said, but his bow remained firm and his arms were agile. From the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, from there is the shepherd, stone of Israel. Psalm 93 verse 4, the Lord on high is mighty. This speaks to the power of Jesus Christ. I love the hymn. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let all let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. That's, that's glorious. That speaks to the might and power of Jesus. And even in the Old Testament, we know it talks about how his kingdom will never end, his government will never end. He possesses all power. And even to bring that in our day and age, right now with these, this hurricane bearing down on the state of Florida, the power it unleashes, it always makes me cringe a little bit on the Weather Channel and the other places in the meteorologists talk about, man, Mother Nature is strong. No, Jesus Christ is strong. And Jesus Christ is powerful. That is a display of His might. That the strongest winds of a hurricane or of a tornado is like a little breath in the light of the power of Christ. And in light of this might, John was humble. In light of the, of the power and the glory of Christ, John had such a humility about him. That's why he could preach and do what he did. His humility. He was used by God because of his humility. God enabled him to be humble. See, we're fit for service, brethren, when we're most humble. When we think less of ourselves. What did John, John said? He must increase, I must decrease. Mm, let that be the cry of our hearts every day. Jesus is not a self-love or a self-exaltation guru. He's a self-hate guru. You follow after Christ because you abhor yourself, not because you love yourself. All these goofy false teachers say something like, you know, before you can love others, you just need to learn to love yourself. I, and I, I told you guys a couple weeks ago when I ran into that young man in Greenville, and he talked about he was struggling to, um, or he said he's learning to love himself. And I said, oh, don't worry, Jesus is a self-hatred guru, not a self-love guru, so you're good to go. And John had that. John was just focused on the glory of Christ and the power of Christ. He says he couldn't even stoop down <coughs> to untie his sandals. 
A slave? If someone had a slave, what was, real, what was really the most menial task they could do? The most humble task? Untie their shoes. Untie their stinky shoes. And John says, I'm not worthy to fall on the ground and to bow my knee and to untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to do that because he's so glorious. And then in verse 8, he says, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. This confuses a lot of Christians because there's a particular denomination, or should I say denominations out there, that talk about Christians need to seek an experience, seek a second experience after conversion, where they are brought into this state of euphoria almost, and they're speaking in tongues, and then they're baptized by the Holy Spirit. In fact, some say if you don't express speaking in tongues, you're not converted. That's a lie in the pit of hell for sure. But is that what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? In order to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, do we now as Christians have to seek after another experience similar to conversion? Well, what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says this. Paul writes to the Corinthians, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body... Though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The one word there that is so important, he uses it twice, is were. Brethren, if you're in Christ, we've been saved those of us who have been converted, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We had it when we were converted. When someone is converted, the Spirit is given to them. The Spirit is given. When we are born again, who are we born again by? The Spirit. Jesus said in John 3, it is by the Holy Spirit that we are born again. And so, when someone comes into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they repent and believe the gospel, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, or by the Holy Spirit, or with the Holy Spirit. So there does not need to be any confusion about this. And we did not seek after some experience, but simply stand upon the truth that is revealed to us in Scripture. Brethren, be like John. Let us seek to be like this man. He's an example to us, brethren. He's an example to us on how we are to reverence our Lord. We ought to say that about ourselves. I don't even consider myself worthy to touch the Lord Jesus' feet. If he were here today, if he were here on earth today, we need to use him as an example even in preaching. And what I mean by that is that each time we show the gospel, that's preaching. We're proclaiming, we're bringing forth the truth of the gospel. It's not preaching in the formal sense, but in the informal. We're proclaiming the glorious gospel. And so John's an example on how we're to do that. We're to do it with boldness and precision. We're to get to the point. We're to deal with the heart. See, true preaching deals with the heart of man. It deals with the intent and the desires. It goes to the heart and just does not be, it's not distracted by other things. So when we share the gospel with someone... Let's not get distracted by side issues. Let's dig to the heart of it. Jesus did this in his ministry. Do you guys remember when uh, in, in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus came and said, uh, said to Jesus, says, came to him by night and said, We know that you are a man sent by God, for no one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. And then what does it say in verse 3? Jesus answered him and said, He didn't ask the question. John, I mean, uh, Nicodemus didn't ask Jesus anything. And it says he answered him. He just, he just avoided everything he says and just gets straight to the heart of it. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's be like that with our unbelieving friends and family. Just get right to the heart of it. We love them, don't we? We want them to go to glory. Let's just get right to the heart of it. You must be born again. You must be saved. Just dig 
down to the heart. And for the lost, for you unconverted souls, I will say in the words of John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your sin. Flee the wrath which is to come. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to come and clear, thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The axe is laid at the root. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Whether you're an outright pagan or a false convert, repent. Repent. If you say you know Christ, but you don't live for Christ, believe truly the gospel of grace. Many are deceived. Many are self-deluded. And many of those to whom John was preaching, they were self-deluded. And thought they knew God. Thought they had a relationship with God. The scribes and the Pharisees, they thought they knew God. But he said, you brood of vipers. So I exhort you to repent and believe the gospel. Flee. Flee the wrath of God which is to come. And be baptized by the Holy Spirit through the new birth. For the glory of God. So we have seen here in this text the prophecy verses 2 and 3, and then the fulfillment of that prophecy in verses 4 through 8 in both John's actions and John's preaching. God is so holy, so perfect in His being, in who He is. As we just saw this morning in our Sunday school, the glory of the Trinity even, one God yet three eternal persons. And in His holiness, God has given us His law you shall not lie or fornicate or steal. And brethren, we know it. We know we broke it. We know we deserve God's judgment for our sin. Not only we have, but all mankind with us have sinned and fallen and deserve hell. And we are without hope, yet God in His love toward us and in an establishment of His justice sent His Son, Jesus, to fulfill the law to die upon that cross and to satisfy the wrath of God. To, to take upon Himself the eternal wrath of God against sin. And He was raised on the third day as a display that God had received His sacrifice to pay for our sin. And 40 days later, He was exalted into glory and He is seated there now. And brethren, we know what we must do. And we've already praised God by the grace of the Holy Spirit. We've done that. He's done it in us, we should say. But the proper response to the gospel is to repent and believe. To flee sin and to flee to Christ and grab hold of Him. And the sinner who does that will be forgiven of all their sins. By grace we are saved through faith. The free grace of Almighty God. As it is revealed in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be forgiven of all their sin. And the sinner who believes on Christ will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Credited with having lived Jesus' life. Because Christ was credited as if he lived theirs. The exchange of the gospel. And I say this every week because this is precious. Christ takes my sin and I get his righteousness. We're wrapped in that righteousness today, brethren. And the unbeliever who is lost, this offer of salvation is laid before them as a free gift of God's grace. And it is all to the glory of God. Salvation is all to the glory of God. John's ministry was all to the glory of God. John's preaching was all to the glory of God. Because it pointed to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to Him I say, we ought to bring glory. To the Lord Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, the mighty one of Israel, I pray, O oh God, 
our God and our King, that your word would transform us. We praise you. We praise you for sending John to prepare your way. To say, make straight the way of the Lord. Lord Jesus, as your word has now gone forth, may you be glorified as it has effect upon the lives of those who have heard it and are going to hear it. May you be glorified, Lord, both now, today, tomorrow, next week, forever, forever, Lord, in everything. It is by your finished work can we have communion with you, Lord. And so we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.